would like to invite James to come up and also Lincoln, who has traditionally been our panel moderator here, uh, to spend a few minutes with both of them. Who has the most provocative question to start us out? <laughs> Go ahead, Caleb. So the question was, in early Utah Mormon history, were there women that drew on Heavenly Mother, Heavenly Mother in the way that they advocated for their positions? Suffrage, suffrage et cetera. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think I have this. I, yes, I'm, so I can use, just use this. Um, I will say, so I think two data points. So the, the quick answer is, we haven't come across anything that explicitly relies on the doctrine of Heavenly Mother to justify or to support their suffrage claims. Um, what's interesting is, you may have noticed, I didn't mention Eliza R. Snow today. Um, Eliza, of course, um, it was the ground dom of, of her generation of Mormon women in terms of the, 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 those that were of age and leading the pioneer entrance. And some of you may know that um, Eliza, who of course penned Know My Father, was actually not unequivocally pro-suffrage. Um, she was a great mentor to a number of the women that we've been talking about. But, there was, um, but she also held a very fine line between supporting the development of women through her restoration of the Relief Society here in 1862 and also holding very fast to a patriarchal observance. Um, and you know, there have been a lot of theories that have been put out about Eliza's experiences being sealed um, you know, to such powerful men and in in her drive as, as a childless woman to support their power, to uphold their power. Um, the experiences that she had had with men in Missouri. You know, I think we have to take all of that into account when we look at Eliza's position on this. She was first and foremost dedicated to the um, patriarchal line of revelation through her prophet husbands. And so we have statements from her in which she, for instance, chastises Emmeline for, who's, who's younger, gen, younger generation, but she chastises Emmeline for being subjective to, being, being subject to the causes of men rather than the causes of God. So, so, there's a, so I think Eliza's fascinating. I, I haven't studied Eliza personally as much as I've studied Emmeline because I get very frustrated with her. <laughs> she really was trying to have it both ways. Um, and I understand that impulse, right? As somebody who works in the contemporary church, as a bridge builder, right? Trying to, trying to bring more, you know, somebody said to me today that I'm the person that their parents can talk, to, talk about, you know, with them. And I, I love being in that position. I'm very much of a middle roader. And, I, and, I, and so while I understand why Eliza was the way she was, it's also frustrating to me that she didn't grasp onto that Heavenly Mother concept. That said, she probably had a vision of Heavenly Mother that was very you know, patriarchally def deferential, right? I mean, there's nothing in Know My Father where she says you know, they're equal beings. She just says she exists, right? We don't know what the relationship is, and em Eliza never expounds on that. Um, I will say, however, that in, 1895, in May of 1895, um, after Eliza's been dead for eight years, Susan B. Anthony comes to Salt Lake. She comes as part of a Western tour, and the timing is really fortuitous because the Utah Constitutional Convention has just happened, and they've just decided to include suffrage in the Utah State Constitution. And Susan comes as part of this, this Western tour to congratulate the people of Utah for being the third state to enter the nation. And Emmeline organizes a conference where she brings in women from Colorado and Idaho and Wyoming and entertains Susan and Anna Howard Shaw for three days. And what is the opening hymn that they sing at the beginning of that conference? It's Oh My Father. 
And I have to think that you know, somewhere in Emmeline's mind, she, I just think that there's something significant there, that she picked that him as the great leader of, of women in Utah at that time, maybe as a deferential gesture to Eliza. But I also think, of course, that um, that, that doctrine did mean something to them. And she wanted to put that doctrine out there as a kind of maybe, maybe in knowing Emmeline, she probably kind of wanted to, to put a little you know, say, hey, we're, not only are we not the oppressed polygamous women that you thought we were for the past 25 years, but we also believe in Heavenly Mother. And uh, I just like, I just like the image of her choosing that hymn for very deliberate reasons. James, you're a cultural observer that I admire. What's your reaction to what Nylon has been talking about, both in her response now and her general presentation? And secondarily, beyond just your initial kind of gut reaction to this stuff, as somebody who knows what the MTA is about and stands for, how would you recommend that we leverage this aspect of our culture? The aspect of gender politics? And the history that we've inherited. Oh. Well, uh, I was just reflecting on this question about um, how theology affects the status of women or vice versa in society. And I, well, I remember when I was a teenager, I, um, when I became a feminist and started reading radical feminist literature in the late 70s, there was a theory prevalent at the time that, um, that there used to be a matriarchy and that, uh, that was overthrown by the patriarchy. And you could tell this by looking at statues of women, goddesses, and things like that. And I think the dominant view, probably then and, and today, um, is that that's really not the case, that the majority of all uh, hunter-gatherer societies have been patrilineal, patrilocal, uh, patri patriarchal. And if you look around the world, um, you know, India, every god has a female consort, and some of them are quite powerful. Kali is a very powerful goddess. Didn't seem to have very much of an impact on Indian patriarchy. Uh, Chinese uh, gods um, and, uh, and ancient ones have female uh, counterparts. Didn't seem to have much impact on their patriarchy. Um, you know, depending on how you look at Europe, Europe is probably the most feminist part of the world, and um, it's either Christian or secular. If it's secular, then the answer is get rid of religion. But if it's if it's patri you know it's a patriarchal religion, Protestant Protestantism there seems to have given birth to a society that's relatively egalitarian for women. So I think there's a very if there is a relationship, it's a really complicated relationship between um, how we think about gods and heavens and and all of that. Um, I, in Buddhism, I grappled with this because Buddhism is the first uh, Indian religion that um, allowed women to leave the householder life and become uh, renunciate mendicants. But when they joined the Buddhist order, um, the Buddha put uh, 17 extra rules on them uh, that they had to be subordinate to the monks. That they had, you know, that there were menstruation things, you know, things that were specific to women. And so you can either look at it as, well, that was a step forward because these women, and they, they wrote wonderful poems. The, the, the Terigata is a, is a text of women who had achieved enlightenment under the tutelage of the Buddha. And they said, I used to just uh, cook and clean all day and my kids were driving me crazy. And then the Buddha came along and he said, leave your household and come join me. And then I did and, and now I'm free. <laughs> you know, and I achieved enlightenment. Um, so you can either look at it as uh, a movement that liberated women or a movement that just um, subordinated them in a different way. And I think it is an incredibly complicated thing. At any rate, uh, your question about uh, the MTA, I mean, I've been thinking about it. I'm, I'm a sociologist and been long fascinated by religion, obviously. And I think what, one of the dynamics that's been going on for the last 300 years is that every faith tradition has been grappling with the Enlightenment. Uh, it's been grappling with um, the, the question of equality, the question of democracy, the question of science, uh, empiricism, um, you know, and in many different ways and in many different little strands of conflict, you see this gradual modernization. You see the gradual weakening of biblical literalism and the uh, adoption of metaphorical understandings, and you see the equality between men and women and the getting rid of the notion of um, inherent differences between the races and so forth as we gradually modernize all of our faiths. So I see the MTA as a part of that tradition, and, and you know my, my take on transhumanism is that this is basically a modern enlightenment movement. It's enlightenment applied to questions of biopolitics and human technology. 
Um, and to the extent that you represent that modernizing tendency within the LDS, I think it's fascinating and, and wonderful. And I, and I see myself as a, a partisan of the same kind of arguments within Buddhism where, you know, it needs a lot of modernizing too. <laughs> you know, 2,500 years of modernizing. Thank you. Next question, Kathy, I think you had one. Uh, my question, can you hear me? Or you can repeat I'll it. repeat it. Okay. Um, the early Utahns were isolated, okay? So it, we lived in an isolated uh, community. And so the values of the Utahns were totally different than they are now in a global society where the tech and uh, science and everything else is really mindset and our values, and a lot of the um, things that we preach are hypocritical because we have one set of standards, I think, for what we feel is uh, worth hanging on to, and, and I'm using that Alice Merrill Horn example. Uh, she was an incredible woman who put together the Utah Arts Council, and yet it doesn't exist as a public art council anymore. It is now part of the state. And part of the collection has just disappeared. The Logan City uh, school system sold off their collection because it hadn't been taken care of. And so there's very little value in uh, the original visual arts in the community now. And yet, we honor these people, but there's a huge disconnect between then and now. Because we're not even teaching fine art in the schools anymore. We have a very limited arts program. I just like to know what, how each of you feel about them and now. So to summarize the question, it seems, if I've understood it correctly, and stop me if I repeat any of this summary inaccurately, we are neglecting our history of arts in our state. And what should we do to rectify that? Is there something we can do to rectify that? Is that a fair yeah, assessment of the implication? And generally, and I'll and I'll add to that a little bit. You know, we've talked today about the importance of these artifacts as we look forward to the redemption of our relationships and redemption even of persons and communities in the future. And so, this question about what are we doing with this neglect of our arts feeds into a transhumanist vision of the future and our ability to redeem it. Thoughts on that? Well, I'll answer by trumping your story with an even worse example. Who's driven on I-15 and seen the, the welfare grain silos right west of downtown, right? Um, there's a reason why we included wheat in our illustration of Emmeline Wells, which is that Brigham Young asked her to, um, to um, create a, a wheat gathering program where she collected wheat from members of the church. And she did this so well that it resulted in the largest sale of grain to the US government during World War I. Um, it also resulted in the creation of the wel welfare department of the church. So the, the, the gathering of wheat as an exercise of LDS women is now no longer identified as something that was either started or cared for by LDS women, it's now part of, of course, the, the welfare department, which lives under the priesthood department in the church uh, administrative hierarchy. So when you walk, when you drive past those grain silos, you can think of Emmeline, but her, inf but her legacy and her influence in that particular area has been completely lost. Sharon Eubank, actually from the Relief Society presidency, has been talking about that legacy in. Um, in some church publications, which has been heartening. But I completely agree. I mean, I think it goes to this example also of like the Richmond Park that I mentioned, this idea that we don't, we're not connecting the exercise of these, these, these legacy projects to their origins, to the people of their origins, to the intent of their origins. And I think it's the whole meaning and whole drive behind Better Days 2020 is that we feel like we need to have a greater stewardship over those projects and re return to their roots and to return to their their, um, the impulses that drove them and the original intent of those 
collections, whether they be of art or of wheat or of political discourse. Um, so I, I, I think that's, that's exactly what I, I feel passionate about. And, and I am sorry about the, I mean, I guess they renamed it, but it doesn't really mean much if they've sold off a lot of the, of the artwork. So that's too bad about the, the Alice Merrill Horn collection. <clears throat> My wife would love to answer your question because she is a fine artist and a sculptor, teaches at University of Connecticut, um, and she certainly thinks that we need more attention to the arts at all levels of education. I guess um, one of the things that has stuck in my mind from the anthropological literature is that uh, the distinction between art and life didn't used to be much of a distinction, the, just as the distinction between religion and science didn't use, used to be much of a distinction, that it was basically the way that things work and the things that we do, and some of the things that we do are what we would now call artistic, but they had purposes. They were, they were seen as meaningful in those societies. I think part of what we're living in now is that we've separated out these different kinds of activity because of the commercial nature. Uh, you know, that you had to be an artist is to make something that then you can sell as art. And if you don't get that kind of validation from the market, well, really, what's the point? It's just a hobby, you know. Um, and I think we have to really go back to that kind of unified world view that we had as hunter-gatherers. Um, and one of the reasons is that we probably are at the end, or the, the last stages of having to work for our living as human beings. I mean, we were talking this morning about technological unemployment. As we move towards a future in which work will slowly decline, or the necessity to work to live will slowly decline, Many people are worried, what, what's gonna, what are we going to do? Are we just going to sit around and take methamphetamine and um, you know, watch Netflix all day, 24-7? Um, uh, no, I think we're going to have a, a human impulse to, to do things, meaningful things with our lives, and part of that will be creativity and art. And so that also reflects on the kind of education that we need. Um, you know, in the short term, yes, we probably need some education that's still specific to job skills, you know, especially if you're paying 70 grand a year to, to send your kid to university, you wanna make sure that they come out with something that will make something back. Um, but we also want to have education for life. We want education to be meaningful uh, to, so that we, they understand themselves as human beings and, and have those creative capacities. We know that that's important too. Thank you. Please, Randy. No, intentionally so. I did, I did think about it. I know, I know. And so I'm saying, and, and this gets back to the, the transhumanist movement we're in. Um, my view, uh, but the question I have for you is, and for both of you, if the transhumanist idea of improving humanity could just do away with menstruation, just do away with defecation, anything stinky, messy, could just do away with Bring them in as adults, or whatever we have. What we're trying to do is get rid of the biological problem. And, and, no, I'm getting. <laughs> so, so we can we can live forever. And how many of you can live in heaven with a privy, right? It doesn't stink. <laughs> and, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm here very serious in my comment here. <laughs>
please do. All right, so to repeat, I'm going to narrow this down to two, two things, and you tell me if this is fair. A question to Nylon about why did you leave out um, the, legacy the legacy of children from your list of ways for women to sustain their legacy. And then I'm going to translate a question to James, and that is, James, um, Randy has proposed a characterization of transhumanism and maybe even a characterization of certain concepts of heaven um, <laughs> that uh, gets beyond messiness, to summarize. What do you think about that? So we'll go Nylon first and then James. Well, uh, let's start with James. Oh, okay, <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> well, um, I'm very sympathetic with your question. I, I, I st argued strenuously with my wife and my daughter that when my daughter was 12 or whatever it was, um, that she didn't have to menstruate. And I showed them the research that showed that the majority of our ancestresses for millions of years probably did not menstruate that often because as soon as they were able to menstruate, they were, being, they were sexually active, they would get pregnant, then they would lactate well, for the children and that would suppress their menstruation and then they would get pregnant again. And so they may have menstruated you know, half a dozen times in their life before they died at 35 or whatever. Um, and that the consequence of continuous menstruation for contemporary women is uh, a higher rate of endometriosis, uh, cervical ovarian cancer, uh, and it's uncomfortable uh, for many. So I argued with them and they said, I want to menstruate <laughs> because it's a rite of passage, it's a, you know, mark, it's, not, it's natural, whatever the arguments are. Um, now, that argument's neither here nor there, but um, I will point to an essay that George Dvorsky and I wrote uh, 10 years ago called Postgenderism. The basic argument was um, there's only so much that you can do as long as we are a sexually dimorph, you know, uh, what do you call it? Dimorphic, dimorphic species. Um, there's only so much that we can do to overcome the uh, gender inequalities that exist. And I was influenced in thinking about this by a woman named Shulamith Firestone who wrote a book, The Dialectic of Sex. She argued that the oldest form of inequality in human society is the inequality between men and women and that it, it arises from the vulnerability that women experience during pregnancy. Um, I think it arises because men can beat women up and have done so for millions of years. Um, but, uh, but yes, they're even more vulnerable during pregnancy and they were pregnant a lot. Um, and she argued that the way to overcome that was to create artificial wombs so that women wouldn't have to bear that particular burden. I took her argument in post-genderism one step further and said, we're in an, a period where we can imagine um, cr making analog all of the digital differences between men and women. Uh, how we dress, um, how, how our bodies work, what kinds of appendages we have. Um, and even theoretically what kinds of brains we have, if there are, there are gendered brains, there's a lot of debate about the gendered brain, but if there are gendered brains, we could probably fix that in the future too. Um, and go in directions that we can't even imagine, have uh, you know, alternatives to this um, uh, gender binary that we're trapped in today. And I think that's the most challenging, because you, know, you talk to a lot of transhumanist guys around today, they're mostly guys, and you say, oh, well, what's your vision of the transhumanist future? I, I want to uh, turn the universe into beer cans and dance at the heat death of the universe. And it's like, okay, so you will still exist. And what do you think you will be like? Well, I'll still be me. I'll, I'll be a dude. I mean, I'll still have a penis. And in, in, tw you know, in two trillion years, you're still going to be a person with a penis. Uh, so I think we really need to liberate ourselves and liberate our imagination about what the future of the human race could be, and it doesn't necessarily involve this gender binary that we're trapped in right now. This is much more exciting than a history conference. <laughs> You're going to join this organization. You know what? Randy's my neighbor. He knows where to find me. 
I'm going to take a stab, but it's not going to be nearly as interesting. Um, I think my thinking was, I think my thinking was that that um, the literal transfer of genes has both. It's been used as. It's been used as the justification for leaving women out of history. First and foremost, and it's also the way women are left out of history in our official records. And so I didn't really want to give it any more. I didn't want to, to feed that beast anymore by saying, um, I, wanted to go, I wanted to look beyond um, that, that rationale um, and look at other ways that we can, can live beyond our lifetimes. And what I mean by that is um, that, you know, as we've talked about the genealogical records that don't include women at all, I mean, part of the reason that they do that is because the idea of gene transfer has been in some cultures and in some times thought of as entirely pat pat is patrilineal, right? So, so it only depends on who the father is, right? I mean, you've got naming rights that come through patriarchal lines. You've got property rights that come through patriarchal lines. In many cases, that woman's genetic fingerprint is not on that person at all. Right, um, in the way that they function in the world. Now, my mind isn't going to three trillion years in the future, so I'm just thinking like the way the way women have functioned in the world. Their genetic fingerprint has not been on their progeny, in the way that we record history, in the way that we record a woman's impact on our communities. And so, I think it's unfair then to say that she does have this big advantage by passing on her traits. It's not any more of an advantage that a man has, and he gets all of the. He's had all of the pat the you know, the, um, the property rights and the naming rights and, all, and the financial rights on top of that. So it's really nothing special for a woman to be able to pass on her genetic code um, because it does, it does benefit the man equally. Um, of course, you know, we do have ex exceptions to that, um, the, the Jewish matriarchal line, for example. But I just think women have been trapped so for so long in this idea that it is their domestic and reproductive abilities that have imprinted the next generation and give them claim on the next generation, that I just wanted to move beyond that. That was really it. Let me, Let me follow up. I, the domestic is separate from the gene. I understand that, but how does a woman transfer more valuable or more influential genes than a man? She doesn't. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is I don't care about my mother's genes. I don't care if she's related to me. I just care she raised me. I love her genes. She influenced my life. That, that, that aspect. Well, you can, cap, you can put that under mentoring, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but like I said, I, don't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I, I, we're at a place in women, the discipline of women's history where we have to look beyond that influence. Because we've just relied on, we've just fallen back on that as an argument for women's influence for too long. And it, it's not to diminish it at all, obviously. Um, but I just think we need to challenge ourselves to look at other ways women are um, alive in our communities beyond just their... Just, just briefly on your question of will we poop in heaven or in the future. Um, <laughs> and I, I think you're onto something, that most people's conception of the divine life, whatever it might be, does not involve going to the bathroom. I mean... Read I, Adam Miller. <laughs> but uh, there aren't very many transhumanists who are thinking about solving that particular problem yet. Maybe they should. Um, but I think uh, when you think about what it might mean to upload into a, a more durable body than the, the biological meat sack that we have to carry around and that we definitely can't go to space in because it will just get cancer and fall apart immediately. So we will have to come up with something better than this meat sack and that probably won't involve pooping. But it will have some kind of waste because it's hard to imagine uh, a living system without waste. But waste heat, maybe. I've been given permission for one final question for both of you. And um, because we want to move on, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll give us a punchy, short response. Oh <laughs> so here's the question. Uh, imagine yourself 1,000 years in the future. Do you, as an identifiable person, exist in some way, yes or no? And if so, what, how do you imagine or hope that you, your sex and or gender will be expressed?
Yeah, well, I kind I of. I don't live in this world as much. I got to think about that one. <laughs> I think I touched on that this morning. That uh, for me, as a Buddhist, which um, you know, but the, fun, the 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 fundamental philosophical thrust of Buddhism is to deconstruct the notion that there is a continuous, discrete self. That and once you let go of that illusion, that that's a liberating thing to let go of, and that you can be a lot happier when you do. Um, and so I think you know a lot of uh, transhumanists carry around this notion that they that, that they can rescue the notion of personal identity in the future. That there's some way to lock it down, reinforce it, and and they they may try, but there's the inevitability of change and the erosion and death of some kind, uh, you know, if it's the heat death of the universe or something sooner. So I don't think, so for me, it's not about, um, I would, I, I'm not going to commit suicide anytime soon, and if I live to be 2,000, I'll be perfectly happy, and that's because I'm not enlightened. But for me, it's not about, the whole project is not about uh, the persistence of my personal identity, and it's really not about the persistence of my personal gender identity. I mean, if I had my druthers, I'd rather look like Christina Aguilera, I'm just too... I'm too lazy to do it, you know, I'm, I'm too poor. Um, but, uh, you know, I think hopefully in the future we'll be able to play with all kinds of identities and, and gender expressions, and already we are. I mean, the, the number of people who are non-binary in our society are growing exponentially, so. I don't know what to say, <laughs> I'm stuck. <laughs> Well, I'm just real. I mean, I, I'm realizing, you know, being exposed to your your your, you know, expanded philosophies here today. I my my vision of myself, my vision of my independent soul is shaped almost exclusively by LDS doctrine. But at the same time, when I think about it, it doesn't have that intense of a gender component. So I love the idea of. Um, the perpetuation of relationships after our death. And I believe that, I, I hope that I have an identity. I like myself enough, I think, that I like, I like the idea of having a consistent identity and a perpetuated identity. Um, but when I think about my role in a community in the future, it's not necessarily gendered. And um, I don't think of myself, first and foremost, as a, as, you know, the, a mother of future souls, for instance. That doesn't hold a lot of um, interest or weight for me. I want to be with my children that I have now, um, and I want to be with my family. But I don't, you know. My husband always, um, my my husband always says that his great philosophical question about the afterlife or is are we uh, a mosh pit or are we sitting around a dinner table? So, <laughs> in other words, do we have a discrete family unit? Um, with uh, relationships intact, or are we just kind of this this interconnected web, kind of like a chain mail, where we're linked together by um, by by similar uh, bonds that create a, a a a network in which individual family units are not as discrete as we think may think they are. Um, and I I definitely fall into the mosh pit category or the chain mail category or whatever analogy you want to use, but. Um, but within that, when I envision that, I don't, I, I don't know. I'll have to think. I'll come back and report. <laughs> I'll come back and report. So I guess the first part is I definitely see myself as myself in a thousand years. But I, I hope I put more credence on, I put more, more hope and weight in my um, communal relationships than I do particularly in my gendered, binary, binary gendered relationships. Thank you, Thank you both. And thanks, Lincoln, for moderating. <laughs>